Like most of us, I had never even heard of the Nabo until about two months ago. However, when I searched for Nabo on YouTube today, it took some serious scrolling to get down to the bottom of the search result. It seems like everyone and their bloody grandmother has made a Nabo video, except for me that is. This weird and interesting little machine has been sitting in that box since 1984, when it was produced. I actually bought my machine while still watching Adrian's video on the day he released it. So it's about bloody time I do an unboxing and have some fun with it. Let's make this intro really short and open up that box instead. To put things into perspective, the Nabo was released on the market just two years after the original IBM PC. One year after the Commodore 64, and roughly 10 years ahead of the World Wide Web. So let's hope there's not a brick in here. Well, it's definitely a keyboard. And man, that is a loud ping. That is going to be interesting to play around with. And we've got the Nabu Personal Computer User's Guide. Well, it's nice and clean inside. And the back. There is some yellow greasiness going on here. And then we've got this smaller box with a flyer and original keyboard cable. And there's quite a smell of Atus Electronics coming out of the box. Nothing bad. It smells like brand new electronics from the 80s. So let's get it out of the box. And it's a fixed cord. That's a bit of a shame. And since it came in its original box, it's obviously really well packed. And the first thing I notice is that it's not very heavy. So let's peel this off. See if we can find a serial number, because it was quite hard to read on the box. Uh, this unit here is 9412, manufacture B2 Rev B, whatever that means. And some of the packing material is stuck to the cord, so I'm going to have to clean that off. And the rubber band on the power cord is just completely wasted. So I'm going to do some quick cleaning off camera. Because I want to have the experience of a brand new machine from 1984. And if the computer wasn't interesting enough, we've got this lovely keyboard. So if you didn't already know, this keyboard has Alps SKCC cream switches. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the same switches as the first Macintosh had. And man, that is a good looking keyboard. That looks fantastic. It's not quite as pingy as the Macintosh 128. But it's definitely a loud enough ping for sure. Let me move that microphone in. We will of course take a closer look in a minute. Okay, well, first impression, before we power it up, it looks like an expensive radio. And that keyboard looks awesome. It looks absolutely brilliant. So the first thing that comes to my mind, how can I make this keyboard work with my modern PC? Okay, the power cord is nice and clean. Let's connect that very long keyboard cable. Uh, like the rest of the machine, these cables are very high quality and really soft. So this machine is nothing like the cheap and cheerful Commodore 64. This machine must have been way more expensive to build. And I'm going to assume that this is composite video. I don't think I have a composite display with a built-in speaker. So I came up with this thing here. Rather bodgy, but it will do for now. Okay, all hooked up, ready for a test. And with that display on top, 
It actually looks rather modern. It doesn't look like a vintage computer at all. I'll add a picture here of the 5150 for comparison. And the Nabu looks so much more modern. This is a really good looking machine. Now let's see if it actually works. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. So, apparently we've got a broken Nabu. I guess this is gonna have to be a repair video. Let's see if we can get to that error. Yes, we did. So, adapter failure as expected. So, that's perfectly normal. But that noise is not normal. So we better turn that off and take a look inside. I didn't get any sound from the speaker and I don't know if it should make a sound at this point. So I'm gonna have to check that. But for now, let's get that lid off and see what made that nasty noise. Well, the screws on the front panel look very fake. But these screws don't. And the paint is slightly chipped off on these screws. That is probably not visible on camera. So maybe it has been taken apart previously. Or that could just be from the production. Who knows? Now let's see if this comes off. Yeah, here she comes. Well, Adrian already went over all the components on the motherboard in his video so I'm just gonna head straight for the power supply where I think we will find our fault so I think we need to bend from this side and if you're playing along please read the sticker well it's definitely a brand new machine so no doubt about that and the first thing I notice here is that these cable shoes are all hand crimped. Uh, let's see if I can get in closer with the camera. So as you can see, this is rather unusual for a mass-produced product. I wonder how many Nabus they made. So it looks to me like they use the standard power supply with the standard cable and the cables were too short so they had to crimp on extensions to be able to reach to where they should go on the PCB that is not something you would normally find in a mass-produced computer and my ROM is revision A and it also has some numbers 9002060 I'm gonna have to check if there are any newer revisions. And if I'm not mistaken, here is where we will find our problem. Yes. So that fan is slightly too large for the housing. That is pretty weird. Never had that before. And speaking of high quality, this is a die cast housing. And I think even, yeah, the fan seems to be in die cast aluminium too. So that is a pretty expensive fan. Nabu seem to have had an unlimited budget when designing this machine. And here's the next weird thing. So these nuts are all scratched up. It looks like they have been screwed in place with pliers instead of the proper tool. Which seems to be a 7mm bolt head screwdriver which is quite hard to reach with so that may explain why they were using pliers and apparently I don't have a 7 millimeter wrench and this one is loose <laughs> okay so perhaps we could do without and the nuts inside seems to be glued in place But that glue doesn't help much. So let's try with an adjustable wrench. Yeah, I can definitely see why they were using pliers. Those are quite hard to reach. 
And the last screw is buried deep down here, so I can't reach it with any wrench. So this is a bit of a problem. Let's try to jam it with a screwdriver. Well, it sort of works. But I'm having some trouble to get it out the very last few turns. Well, I've been struggling with a screw for quite a while now. And that nut inside is completely jammed in old glue. And impossible to reach with any tool. So we're gonna have to drill it out. Well, I guess if you're having the same problem, perhaps you could try with some chemicals to dissolve that old glue. Or just use some brute force like I do. Okay, so then we have a ground lead down here that needs to be removed. And luckily there is no glue on that screw. Yeah, here you can see that old glue. Uh, the wire seems to be attached underneath the PCB, so we're going to have to remove the entire PCB. And as you probably have seen in other videos, these machines don't have reefer caps. So that's nice. And as you can see, these are switch mode power supplies. So again, uh, expensive parts. And uh, this is hand crimped too. Check these buggers out. So they didn't make any custom cables for this machine. Instead, they seem to have gone with standard cables and then modify them to fit. Okay, so now we only need to detach the fan, or so I thought. This one doesn't have a connector, <laughs> but that wire is long enough so we can repair the fan without removing that wire. And I just received my new microphone in the mail. So thanks everyone for the feedback about the sound. So I'm gonna have to charge these and start using them in the next video. And I went with Rode Wireless Go 2 with the matching Rode Lav 2. So hopefully there will be a better sound on this channel from the next video on. Okay, so that's quite a bloody fan. This thing is heavy. I don't think I'm far off if I would guess that this fan is a third of the weight of this entire machine. And it's powered by mains. And it's an EBM V2S075. And it's made in West Germany. And we're obviously not going to replace it. This fan is probably 10 times better than any Noctua fan available today. So we're gonna try to repair it. And I also noticed that it actually has a small amount of dust inside. So either this machine has been extensively tested or this might actually be a unit that has been in use by a customer and return. Perhaps because of the noise this fan makes. Who knows? So I think we need to remove this clip. And then trying to find it somewhere on the floor. There it is. Okay. Let's see how this works. Well, there are some minor scratches on the inside of the housing. Yeah, this thing is crazy. <laughs> Why did they choose such a fan? It doesn't really make sense in a PC. And there are some tiny, tiny marks on the fins so it's quite clear that it is slightly too large for that housing and i think i may know what happened here i think it's quite clear on the camera that they have used way too much paint so this large blob here that's paint so i think that there's just too much paint on top of these fins so I'm just going to clean them off with a file. Uh, this is not going to be interesting to watch, so I'll just do this off camera. But I will basically just scrape off some of the excess paint. 
and then we'll try it out. And I think I'm gonna add some tape to cover up the motor because we probably don't want that dust inside the motor. Let's see if that is enough. Uh, we might as well add a drop of machine oil in case that bearing has dried up. Okay, let's put it back in and see if the noise is gone. Yeah, I have to say, very serviceable fan. Okay. Yeah, that noise is gone. So, easy fix. And I was wrong about those screws in the front panel. They are not fake screws at all. They are actually real screws. And I'm not surprised at all now that we have seen the rest of the machine. So let's do a quick test of that fan. Well, the noise is obviously gone, but it's also very, very silent. That is an excellent fan. Let's put it back in the machine. And I'm not sure about the design choice. To have those hand crimped wires underneath the PCB. And these wires are mains power. So if this would come loose and touch the chassis, that would be a pretty bad thing. So I'm gonna use a few extra zip ties and make sure that it can't move around. And let's add one more. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Better safe than sorry. Yeah, I've actually already touched mains once this week. And I don't feel like I need to repeat that experience. And the power supply, by the way, is made in Japan. So probably a pretty good one. Well, I'm not too keen on reusing those screws and nuts with glue on. So let's try it with something more modern. Uh, see if this will work. And uh, these are, of course, also designed to remove any vibration that may be coming off the fan. Yeah, I think that will work, but I will put all of them in and make sure that it's firmly attached. Well, that didn't quite work because this screw hole down here was just too difficult to reach to use one of these. But I did find a solution. So these are just modern regular fan screws. I had to use a bit more force than on a plastic fan, but they fit perfectly. So that fan isn't going anywhere. So now we can put that lid back on. Okay, let's see if Nabu is silent. And it is. Okay, so the machine is fixed, so we can move on. But first I want to show you something. Check this out. So I found an almost perfectly matching display. So I guess Nabu was 10 years ahead of its time when it comes to design. Unfortunately, this display is way too long to sit on top of the machine. This JVC used to be a rack mount display. So I guess this is some kind of a rack mount standard size. Uh, perhaps that will explain the length. But perhaps we'll use it anyways, because that's a match made in heaven, or at least in Canada. I hope the camera picks it up, but that color is extremely similar. I can barely see the difference. But check this out, even the font is the same on the text. And this display also syncs quite well with my camera, so I don't think you can see any flickering. So that's a good thing, so perhaps we'll use it. Okay, so let's move on and see if we can get some software in that Nabu. Okay, so if you didn't already know, these machines relied on the Nabu network over cable TV to access software and uh, were completely useless offline. Even the DOS was broadcasted, so they don't even have an OS. DOS, by the way, in this case stands for Downloadable Operating System. Not to be confused with MS-DOS. Unfortunately, the network only lasted between 1982 and 1985, rendering this machine completely unusable. At one point, I think they actually were sold as project boxes on eBay. 
But I'm glad I picked one up anyways, because since then YouTuber DJ Sirs teamed up with a former NABU programmer, Leo Binkowski, and founded the NABU Preservation Project to restore the original NABU network with software emulation. And to access that software we need an RS-422 to USB cable. So that's what we're making here. And instructions can be easily found online. And from what I can tell here, it seems to be pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is the final result. And somehow I managed to remember to put the sleeve on the cable. So we can now put this piece in. So the final step is to put that sleeve on and lock it down with a screw. And it's done. Okay, let's try our freshly made cable and see if it works and the other end of the cable is going to go to this RS-422 converter to USB and hooked up to the T60P. Well it doesn't get much worse than this when it comes to bodge wires but now we have error codes. So I had a look on YouTube and I watched a NABU video and when that guy pressed reset switch he got error beeps, so I decided to replace that speaker with a smaller speaker, but that didn't help. So now it's connected to my amp, and uh, now we have error beeps. Okay, with that sorted, I ran into the next problem, so I have skipped ahead here a bit. So my RS-422 drivers came on one of these silly CDs, or DVD. I think it's a CD. Doesn't matter. It didn't work in the T60. So I tried it on an old compact, and that compact could read all the files, except for the driver we need to use on that CD-ROM. So I went on Google and found drivers for a very similar adapter. And now we've got COM4 here. So we are ready for a test. So I went to nabo.ca and downloaded the software, and then I just clicked settings. And here we can change to COM4. So let's save, power up the NABU. And I guess we should start RS-422. NABU network adapter simulator server running. Uh, we still got an adapter failure. Let's try to boot. Okay, Compact Presario 1700 to the rescue. So apparently this Compact Presario 1700 could in fact read that tiny CD-ROM. So now we can install the drivers that actually came with the adapter. So now we've got the original drivers. Let's try to reinstall and see if that helps. Okay, let's try again. Okay, so that damn thing just grabbed a random driver. So I guess we're gonna have to help it find the correct driver. Okay, I did a bunch of troubleshooting off camera. But I can't find any mistakes or any faults. So I ended up making that cable much shorter. Let's see if that causes all trouble. And uh, no, it doesn't bloody work. So I wonder if this adapter is bad. Because the green light doesn't light up. And it should when we're sending data. Or I guess something could be wrong with the driver. Well, it definitely doesn't send anything. Well, I'm gonna have to do some thinking here and see if I can figure this out. And while I do, let's take a look at the piece de resistance, the NABU personal computer keyboard. And we are, of course, going to compare it to the original Macintosh keyboard, the MO110, that also uses the SKCC cream switches. So let's be a bit silly here and find out if we have a new king of ping. So I'll move my microphone and we'll have a listen. That is actually pretty close, but I'm gonna say the original Macintosh keyboard is slightly louder. That damn thing is still ringing. Realizing we are a bit silly here, but we're having fun, so who cares? Let's see if it comes in at number two. Let's bring in the Model F for comparison. Now this is a completely different beast, with a completely different sound. But it's the second loudest keyboard, at least that I have. So let's make a comparison. Yeah. 
Yes, the Nabu definitely beats the Model F. So we've got a new second loudest keyboard. And the original Macintosh still reigns supreme as the keyboard with the loudest ping, at least that I know of. So enough with the silliness, let's take a look at those switches. So let's gently just pull one of these keycaps off. And as expected, it's a very nice double shot cap. Now let's compare it to the Macintosh. That isn't double shot. However, it has these two tabs. And I guess perhaps they are making that very loud ping. Because when we push the switch, these two tabs here, they are hitting the switch. And probably causing all that noise. And another thing I noticed is that I have turned the switches 90 degrees compared to the Macintosh. So I did a search online and apparently the length of the key stem is the only difference between these two switches. Well, next week is actually Marchintosh, so perhaps I'll leave this keyboard on the bench. Okay, so enough of the silliness. I'll do some thinking and troubleshooting and see if we can make that Nabu work. Well, I did some thinking and troubleshooting. I checked wiring with a multimeter and the cable checked out good. I also installed the RS-422 converter on my main Mac and one of my other Windows PCs, but I got the same result. So unfortunately, I think the converter is shot. I hate when this happens. Trying out one of the games would have been the perfect ending to part one. Well, moving forward, I'm not sure I'm going to order a new converter, because I have something else in mind for this Nabu. But we will of course try out the network in one of the upcoming videos. Last week I launched a Patreon account and invited you to join me there too. So I would like to thank the very first patrons of this channel. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for supporting my work here on YouTube. I put a lot of effort into making these videos, so getting your appreciation really means a lot to me. Thank you so much. If you want to become a supporter to this channel too, feel free to become a patron. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and don't forget to ring that bell below.